Okay, well, okay let's, let's get started then. So, um, welcome to our latest uh, Taiwan Indigenous Studies uh, uh, lecture. This is a project that we've been doing, that we're going to be doing for this year and uh, next year. Uh, and the, the aim of the, uh, these, these lectures is to look at topics related to uh, contemporary issues related to Taiwan's indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So quite, quite different from our uh, previous focus on, on quite historical issues. Um, the project is sponsored by the uh, Shuni uh, Museum, in, in, um, uh, which is the museum that's, um, uh, do, that focuses on Taiwan's indigenous people that's opposite the National Palace mm -hmm. um, uh, Museum. Um, and today, I'm delighted to welcome back um, uh, uh, Joyce yeah, yeah, um, who's at the um, uh, National Donghua University's um, uh, Department of Ethnic and Relations. Cultural Relations. Relations. Relations and Cultures. Yeah. Um, uh, but I say welcome back because she was last at SOAS uh, in 1999 yeah. when she was a first year uh, PhD student. Um, she, she did her PhD in sociology at uh, Lancaster um, uh, University, uh, but somehow we've never managed to bring her um, uh, to so. So I should thank Jia Yuan to a certain degree for um, um, uh, for the uh, invitation, persuading her to uh, to come here. She'll be giving two talks. Tomorrow's talk uh, will be at the same time as, as uh, three o'clock, but in the, the Brunei uh, Gallery. Yeah. Um, uh, I will, I will we'll confirm the exact uh, location. Uh, I think it's B two o four. Okay, great. Okay, so on that note, let's give uh, George a very big um, uh, SOAS welcome. Uh, thank you for all coming, and uh, it's great to see. It's really my great honor to be here to share what I've been doing since two thousand and four when I back to Taiwan. So today, actually, I think we changed the time is because we want to ship, otherwise people will watch football. Mm -hmm. And I hope after the talk, I let you feel food is much more important than football. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming, and my talk is learning to farm and cook participatory action research uh, on edible heritage. So uh, I'm going to. I'm not going to tell you about what is participatory action research, but I'm going to share with you what I've been doing and how I do it and what I've been doing. Okay. So it's also a contemporary issue about I think food is everyday life and how this everyday life related to identity. That's what I'm going to focus tomorrow. But today I'm going to start with a little bit about my personal because it's probably very me. Yeah, so I'm going to start with this. Okay, so uh, my standing point, who am I? Okay, so as a Taiwanese single woman and Han Chinese father and a Taiwanese mother. Okay, and so in Taiwan we call this sweet potato and towel, half Taiwanese, half Chinese. So, so I'm kind of mixed. All this mixed cultural identity actually led to me interested in learning English literature. So uh, my, my, actually my PhD actually is, uh, uh, I'm a Chinese American woman, it's, her name is Matthew Hong Kingston. And she, her research is about these two cultures, how these two cultures mix and they survive in, as one person because she was born in America as a Chinese. People think she's Chinese, but she thought she's American. Yeah, and all this, so it's break silence. And how she used writing become to search her identity. So all this kind of uh, breaking silence. Yeah, so that's my MS thesis. And after I got my master's degree, I taught English for eight years. So during that eight years, I had four months pay holiday. So that's why I'm traveling around the world. So to, to learn English to make a better English speaker. Yeah, so at that time, most of my identity is more like a Western culture. Yeah, so that is, and then after like eight years traveling, uh, about 40 something countries backpacking by myself, and I want to get a more intellectual level, and I found a book called Tourist Gates, that's written by John Irving. So I wrote him a long email, 
and say, oh, this book, I found this book in the library, and I know nothing about you, but I think what you write about is really related to what I want to do. So, and then he, she just, he just he applied to me. Applied, interesting applied, and put me in contact with secretary. And that's how I end up doing a PhD in sociology. I, I sometimes say sociology of tourism. Yeah. So, and my title is Journey to the West. And if you know about the Chinese literature, you know this is praying words, xi or ji. Mm -hmm. But this West, what I mean the West, and then so traveling, learning, and consuming Englishness. And for a Taiwanese who was researching on Englishness, so there's also interesting kind of culture. So I call this revise, reverse Orientalism. Yeah, so that's my PhD about. So it's nothing to do with indigenous studies. It's nothing to do with what I've been doing. But when I do this research, a lot of Taiwanese young students come to this country in order to learn the culture, the language. But what they do is they're complaining about food mm -hmm. is horrible. English people are cold. The way <laughs> it's terrible. So, but they want to learn about the cultures here. So, for me, this is kind of journey is also for me to rethink. When we talk about authentic culture, when we talk about English culture, what does that mean? Then, when we talk about West, from where? What is the point of view we talk about West and East? So already thinking about this post-colonial concept. But then, when I back to Taiwan, I applied. So I got a job in 2004, and I teach in this ethnic relations and cultures. At that time, that's called indigenous cultures. And that's the, the only school I applied, university I applied. And I taught since then. So it's been 14 years. And I remember when I back to Taiwan, it seems that like I completed doing another PhD called Indigenous Studies. So that's how. And then, um, 2012, my life, I built a place called Breathing Life in the East Coast. So that related to continue what I'm doing besides an as academia. So, and now I live with 32 chickens. Yeah, so, and two geese. Yeah, so that's me, where I stand. And this is the story I'm going to share with you today. So here, participant action research to me actually is, you not only see the problem, it's really what we do about the research. So my action is about what we, are we really what we eat, or what we farm, or what we do? So it's like a field work. Uh, Amanda Kofi in her book, Writing Ethnography, Writing, she said, feel work is a personal, emotional, and identity work. And if I change that feel work into research, it fits, especially for qualitative research. It's really about your own identity, what you're interested, what you're concerned about. So this is our starting point. And this is where I, when I start teaching a lot of food related courses, I, I went to learn how to cook. So this is also my field work, to work in the kitchen with the indigenous chef. So this is part of my action research, how I do. And I also brought, later you will see, I also brought this kind of indigenous shelf to the university campus to be a teacher so they can share their knowledge with the university students. And this is my home, and this is, I, people have to pay for me to walk and farm with me. I'll tell you more <laughs> about all these working holidays. Okay, yeah, so probably not many professors on university will bring your Wellington boots and to go to university. And so I want to put, because sometimes my talk, I, I kind of, Sidetrack. So this is actually my conclusion about all this kind of talk and also framework about food. Okay, why it matters. Okay, and also here. So it's actually for indigenous people, you probably, if I ask people, even you've been to Taiwan, if I ask you, what is indigenous food in Taiwan? What would you come up with? 
Since so you have a yes. Taiwanese wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really don't know. Yes. <laughs> now we have what? Macau. Macau. Yeah, yeah okay. Kind of Macau is a mountain pepper. Yeah, mm -hmm. Macau. Yeah. What else? We have other Taiwanese? Oh, when I traveled to Hualien, yes, and I met a friend from Amis. Amis, and yes. She showed me. Perhaps you know. Which one? Blue Thailand. Blue Thailand. You said it. Oh, like you can just uh, eat it. Roll, see. Roll, like roll, see with shells, with shells, but like, 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 like in really small size. Like little clams. Yeah, like little clams, but with uh, with just like one side, and so. Um, because she told me in Amis, and I don't. Do you remember, remember the word? It's okay. It's okay. Laura, you've been to Taiwan oh, one yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's okay. But we have a couple of people who might be there. Yeah. Some and then yeah. we do have an indigenous. Uh, Beyond his Uno try, yeah. he's almost got his PhD. Yeah. So what would be your answer then? Another guess I brought myself. Chinabu. <laughs> Chinabu. Yes. I'll show you uh, later what does Chinabu look like. Okay. And also, actually, um, I wish I could share some of food with you, but of course the law is not allowed. But I do. <laughs> I do have some. Um, this is uh, another thing. It's supposed to be uh, like for indigenous people that stuck the sticky rice inside it and steam it. Okay. So for those people who later ask questions, you can get one of this as a token or souvenir. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So and I will I will show you this. For that, they they use this for nature, the nature, the plant. Yeah, and then start with the rice and steam it and bring it to the mountain. So and then when they finish, they just put that and become part of nature again. Yeah. So they, this is their ecology knowledge. Yeah. So essential for I will tell you more about what is indigenous food. Yeah. And you can tell it's very hard for people to say something about indigenous food yeah and i told you we have 16 recognized tribe and still so far people are still hard to say something about what they know about taiwanese indigenous food yeah and that's this is part of my research why to make this invisible cultural identity culture to more white uh, visible okay so essential indigenous Festival and traditional men food of everyday life. Okay, for when they have festival, for example, there's certain food like millet. Yeah, the millet or millet wine, and a certain of food they will be offered during the festival time. Yeah, and but of course it's it's they are traditional men food, and now they're already because the rice. Yeah, they all change that, and the ways of social communication and cultural healing. When in Taiwan, when we have that huge disaster, and then people, you know, the food get them sense when they eat it, this is their food, yeah, and they feel kind of connection with their own past, yeah. And where's the social exchange or definition of self, community, and ethnicity? Uh, even we say there's a mainstream fast food culture, and they still remain about their certain special. Uh, food tradition and that's part of them to say who they are okay and as uh, the food of course related to the land and you know land issue is always the main issue for indigenous people it's not only in Taiwan but also in the world too and also their people lifestyle and this traditional ecology knowledge I call it not Everybody knows TEK, but it's traditional ecology knowledge. Because from that, we know how their relationship with nature, how their relationship with the environment, and how they position themselves with this full chain, the system. And of course, according to Alpha Durai, it's also collective representation of ethnic landscape. So this landscape, full scale, 
This is how I want to bring more people back to the farm, back to the land, from campus to community. Okay, yeah, so, and there's two important books actually help me to come up with this concept about edible heritage. So I invented this, this term, and I need more theoretical idea to talk about, because when people talk about heritage, they talk about tangible and intangible heritage. They use UNESCO definition. But so far, not people talk about edible heritage. That's a part of our everyday life. So this kind of edible, these two books, actually, but this book, two books are all case studies. Mm -hmm. It's all different cultures, and because you see the edible, this is all come from conference and then combined with the book. Uh, so I use this kind of edible identities and heritage cuisine become this concept about edible heritage. And I hope maybe later when we have a Q&A section, you can give me more feedback, help me to think about how make more theoretical. Yeah. And of course, all these cases, nothing. There's only one, there's two books, about 28 chapters in total. Only one chapter talking about Japanese food tradition. Nothing related to Asian food culture. But we know Asia is the major food culture in terms of food heritage. But it seems nothing there, not to mention about Taiwan or Taiwanese indigenous food culture. Yeah. So how many people can recognize this plant? Is it millet? Or yes. Oh. You got one present. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, it's millet. Yeah. And this millet actually for some people think it's a bird food. It's for birds. Yeah. But for Taiwanese indigenous people, it's their traditional man food. Yeah. And they make this into especially in the festival. All kinds of festivals that use millet. And, and uh, uh, beyond say about Chinavu, yeah, they have to use millet. Yeah, they pound it inside and steam it. And you can cover with another plant's leaf and steam it. Okay, so, and it's come out from, so land, food, and land justice. And also related to how they look at the food. For example, Bunong Choi, all the festival, related to when to plant the millet, the seeds, and when to transparent the, the plants, and when to harvest, and when to put the seeds, to save the seeds, all that related to, and also it's related to their language and their culture. And if people don't plant millet, they lose all this. Yeah, so it's also significant for them, and I use that for my, in, for my students, including indigenous students and non-indigenous students, to learn through all this festival. Yeah, so I'll show you more. And so we create something on campus, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I want this to show that in Chinese, so people mm -hmm. will know my research partner. So we have Donghua University where I teach, and then also the Miller Farm, and I have to say, proudly to say, Miller Farm is all initiated by students themselves, not me. I'm just the one who work with them and support them in behind. The students say, we want to grow Miller on campus. And what do we do? We need to apply the piece of land. And luckily, Donghua University is the second biggest campus in Taiwan. So when we, we're going to have a new president and all, oh, and it's very political. That moment, students apply and we got it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we got a piece of land on campus. Yeah. And after this, I also have my FATS team. I'll tell you more about what this FATS team means. Yeah. And then also from university, I also work with Trinity Elementary School. So since 2013, we work together. And, and, and the project still continue with or without project funding. I'm still doing that. And then also since 2012, and this has become part of our indigenous college features. And also the Zilo, the Amis. So 
Now I want to end as a team called Mibaliu. Mibaliu for Amis language is sharing labor and it's share cultures and then adapt that concept to make a team which can promote their uh, indigenous community, indigenous culture and also doing some tourism performance uh, promotions. Yeah. So yeah, back. How many? I think I already said Taiwan has 16 recognized tribes. Okay, you can see here. And Donghua is located here. And the elementary school between is about six city kilometer. And so actually I'm learning my Amis language with all these student elementary kids every Monday. I go there and I also participate with them. And I just passed my beginning level. And I'm going to do the advanced level this year, at the end of this year. So we have 16 tribes, yeah? And so before you see the nine tribes, it's not anymore. We have 16. And I'm sure we will have, we still have more, but the government will recognize more. I think the plain tribe in Puzhu will be recognized very soon. Yeah, so this is give you the map of Taiwan. You can travel from north to south in one day, even return trip, because we have high speed train now. But not in the in the east coast. Yeah, here. So. Yeah. So this is welcome to Donghua. So this is the land we cultivate, and this is our students. Yeah. And then you see the mountain. Yeah. The, the they've been recognized Taiwan. Some people vote the most beautiful campus in Taiwan, which I don't agree. But yeah. But they yeah because of this to me is because of this landscape. Yeah. So this is a piece of land, and then so the student was trying to reclaim the millet because it's, you need to make them have some, some space so they can grow well. Yeah, and here. Yeah. So here, everything we made that ourselves, you know, by hand. And all these students, they initiated by themselves, and later I combined with my class together, but still, here. Yeah. So, Participant action research for me is a way of knowing, especially for students, and also for me as a, as a non-indigenous people. It's also a way to decolonizing so-called Western mainstream knowledge, yeah, and bring the indigenous knowledge back to them everyday life. Yeah. And it's also their identity performance. We also teach the hunting culture, but in Taiwan, people know actually hunting is still against the law. But that's one of the things that practice their ways of living. And we, we brought that back to, to campus. So they are not knowing from the books, the written words. They're learning that by doing. And who taught, not me, because I don't know about this. So I brought the indigenous elder to the campus. Yeah. And we also gave them a certificate as an honorable P. PhD oh. Miller Farm mm -hmm. lectures. So they are happy. Normally they wouldn't be able to come to university to share our knowledge. But we do that. You know. And then it's also they are like like uncovering the indigenous knowledge territory, sovereignty. Yeah. Food sovereignty or the, the indigenous sovereignty. Subjectivity is very important. Yeah. To me. It's actually when I taught uh, two thousand and four Four when I back, you know, I I really know nothing, not much about indigenous. But for me, my knowledge is from when I was in university. I was in a we call mountain service, Sandy Fu Yeah, I got the knowledge from that. So I kind of romanticize about indigenous people or think they are poor, so they need me to help them to serve. So this is most of Han Taiwanese people the concept about indigenous people. But when I, when I back to teach that, the more I teach, the more I know I know nothing. And I need to learn. So it's to, for me, it's another PhD or another. And then I learn from my go to uh, indigenous community and do a lot of field work and a lot of talking with elder people to get myself knowledge so I can stand here and share my knowledge with my students. Yeah. So for the middle farm, 
Then we have this, so we also do field work during the winter break. We also have farming and workshop. Yeah. We know nothing about, even myself, I know nothing about how to farm and how to grow millet. So again, we do the field work and we come and practice, so we're learning by doing, and all this different festival, workshop, and then also the summertime students doing community service, they stay with community to learn all this knowledge, and then bring back to campus. So this is also it's kind of intercultural interaction, and learning from each other. And so this is kind of a circle, a learning circle, yeah. Yeah, and then, see, does anybody know this? It's very popular now, very healthy food. Is it quinoa? Yes, oh. Juliet, you're right, you got another pleasant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's, we call Taiwan Formosa, Formosa quinoa. Yeah, uh, Hongli, but Hongli now, because there's some orange color, so now people like to use Taiwan li. Rather than for most, rather than Hongli, because there's some orange and the red orange between there's different four colors. So so here and this is our harvest and you can tell this is uh, the culture teachers. This is Sakilaya, yeah. And for Sakilaya, for them they lost their language and they bring this back. So they bring their culture back because of that. And this is Bunong Choi and there's a student and imagine. When they wear this tri their traditional clothes and with this, yeah. So, and that never happened on campus. So when 2012, and then we have first harvest, and it's become quite news on some of indigenous media. Yeah, okay. yeah. and then also, because my background is a tourism, so I also, when you say, and how do you manage to have this funding? So I organize a walking holiday. People have to pay and walk with us. Uh -huh. Yeah, they have to pay. So this walking knowledge, yeah, say walking holiday, and they come and help us. This is say, please come to Donghua Miller Farm and, and walk and labor with, learning and labor with us together. So they pay for us to walk with us, and then we build this house, yeah? I'll show you more. See here, we build, so I build my own classroom because I, I don't like the traditional classroom. We build this and we extended the kitchen too. And that's all, yeah. So here the students, we all learn this kind of hand count, uh, made by hand, and then work with the elder because none of us know how to build a house, yeah. So we invite the elder and come and help us. Yeah. You can. If you have any questions, you can stop me because I think we are quite laid back. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I like the interaction way. And if you feel sleepy, ask questions. Oh, then yeah. you will yeah. wake yourself up. Because after lunch, this is supposed to be good sitting outside, enjoy the sun. Yeah. So for me, this kind of open space is also an alternative mode of education. And that is also, as a teacher, for me, is to change the way students learn. You know, now most of students only use hand to type computer, to use their phone. They don't know this. They don't know how to build a house. They don't know how to grow their own food. So this is also my, my as an educator, how I want to achieve. And it's not only here. It's all from this made by yourself and also bring your relationship with the land, with the nature, people start to think this who really, yeah. And then that combined with the whole global, this slow food movement, yeah. So, yes. See, you can tell this is Bu Nong Choi elder come and show us about how the important for hunting culture. And by their narratives, their stories, students will know why we want this kind of hunting culture to be legitimized. And they will be our supporter. Yeah. Okay, so, and this is our harvest. And we pass off, we, we don't use this for business. We use that to share the seeds for people to grow more millet. Yeah. Okay.
This is what I say, the summer camp, a winter camp. Yes. Yeah, so this is kind of intergen. See, there's a different elder, and we, so we also have students' parents come and help. Yeah, help us. Yeah. And we have international students come and join us, and we have some indigenous students. Huh? Which one? This? No, that's his team. Now he's doing a PhD in our in our uh, is environmental college. Yeah, and indigenous students. And so so for them, yeah. So very few. So I wear my Chan Kuli hats. Yeah, to university to teach. Yes. Yeah. And. He is really good in. He use uh, his, and this is our cultural translator because my Puno language is not good enough to be translated. He can speak some Mandarin Chinese, but he use Puno language, mm -hmm. one of the indigenous language, and then she can translate that for us. You know, yeah. So indigenous form is Donghua, and in 2012, if you remember. There's also an Occupy movement, right? So students think, or I think, it's also an Occupy movement at Donghua, at university. And also, for them, it's a cultural practice of their lifestyle. And it's also where some knowing, being, and doing. Yeah, this is a culture, for me, it's a life. And culture, if we want to say traditional life, knowledge, it's not in a museum. It's in your everyday life and pass on, and for me, that's traditional culture. Yeah. And this is cultural heritage, and this is also proud to be who they are. And they can tell people about, about even as a Han Taiwanese, you can be a cultural um, mediator to introduce about the culture you know to other people. Yeah. And here, so if you come to Donghua University, come and take a picture. Being there, done that, taking a pictures, this cultural landscape. And of course, for all this combined with tangible and intangible heritage, culture, and it's also an intercultural platform, and of course, intergeneration learning sites. Yeah, so, so far, so this is what we're doing on campus. Any questions? So what, what course are the students taking? Okay, yeah, so later I create a course called Food, Culture and Society. Yeah, and it's a general, it's a general education, Tong Shi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in Tong Shi, that means it's general course, so all the department students can sign in the course. And that's my purpose, because mm -hmm. I, I don't want the indigenous knowledge only learned by indigenous students. I want more Taiwanese students to know about Taiwanese indigenous culture because that's part of Taiwanese. Yeah. Any, any, yes? That's my question as well. I just want to know who are participants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I also have my own, I have also ethnic and culture, and that's selected course in my department. Yeah. So, and I want to create more. So the generation, so so more students can come, and my course is also open to the public. So we have some uh, mm -hmm. like the public people will come and join and and as uh, join us. And the parents, how, how did they? Yes, because because the kids talk about the course, the parents was very interesting. So can we come? Sure, I want them to come. Mm -hmm. So you will see later. I have other. So this is growing things, right? Learn to farm. And then the, the other part is learn to cook. Yeah, and that's more exciting too. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, so then, it's a Miller Farm, still for me, Miller Farm still student center. I, they, they, they initiate the events. So, for that, food, agriculture, tourism, sustainability. Yeah, so actually it's, it's the food and Tourism studies, <laughs> yeah. But then I thought, if I want to do something, I don't want studies. Yeah. Okay. So then, and then the more I do food and tourism, that will lead to agriculture, because I start to think about where the food comes from. Yeah. And then, so how do people grow food? 
it's become part of my major concern. And then, so this kind of nature, this is organic, I call environmental friendly growing. I don't use organic because you need to certificate, you can call organic. But for natural ways of growing food, yeah, that's what we promote. Yeah. So now fats become food, agriculture, tourism, sustainability. Yeah. And all this is my it's a kind of grassroots activism and it's a university and community partnership. Uh, work together, collaboration, yeah. And then so all this and then I don't know whether in I think in, in England, especially Jamie Oliver, you know, mm -hmm. I wish he can come to Taiwan mm -hmm. and then to cook with our indigenous, we have a naked he will see later and they can cook together and promote the food. So we have Shi Nong Jiao Yu in Taiwan. So agri food education. Yeah. And it's it's now a very popular. Yeah, and I think they're going to become required and, and I don't like that idea. Mm -hmm. Everything become required is horrible. Because the teacher probably know nothing but they have to teach. Mm -hmm. So they hate that. And then mm -hmm. we end up all the kids who will hate that courses too. Yeah. So I don't know. I and then I promote this kind of responsible travel. Yeah. And then tourism concern and then this yeah, and here I have to say eco tourism doesn't mean eco tourism. A lot of eco tourists will become eco tourists. Yeah. Because everything is self centered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that in, in tourism there's always have this different hierarchy about are uh, you tourist or are you traveler and we are better, the backpacker is better than all these mass tourist tourists. Yeah. But for me, we all damn tourists anyway. Yes. Yeah. And then we all want to take pictures, we all want to buy souvenirs, we all want to uh, get the most of things, but we want to pay less. Yeah. So, uh, but there's also response, how can we travel in a responsible way? Yeah. So this is also how, um, and I'm very happy for me, I also teach some reductive tourism courses. And my student for this at the end, one have a project, how can we travel to make this grow better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so they have come up with a lot of ideas. You can, every time you go to a beach, you take 20 kilos garbage away with you. So to cl clean the beach, mm -hmm. Tan, yeah. So they come up with some ideas and, and they want to do that every semester. So not only the project finish, they want to do that every semester. And when they finish their university, they've been doing, become the expert, and they can continue organize wherever they work. So I'm, I'm happy that kind of things are happening. And it become not just like, okay, it's the end of this class, end of this term. They will continue practicing and, and, and doing and become part of their life, which I think knowledge, the function for knowledge, yeah. So this is also this farm to table, from Chong Chan Di Dao Chan Zhuo, from farm to table, this also uh, encourage people to grow the food and then or to know where your food comes from or this farmer's market. And I, I have to say actually farmer's market when I study in Lancaster, I already that's my first concept, first contact with I think every Wednesday, right, in the, or whatever. Yeah. And there's a farmer's market that you can talk, really, they will tell you about all this organic food and, and, and how they, and the different apples. It's not only the supermarket you see, or mm -hmm. yeah, they have different varieties of apples, yeah. So this is fats, and fats is are uh, still, it's, it's I work with my student who are also interested in food and tourism, but this is, this is um, this is as a researcher, as an educator, I combine with my patients about food and tourism, and that's part of my participant action research. Yeah, my two old friends are here. They all know I have passion about food. Remember, I have an eating club. Yeah. When I was writing my thesis, I was um, one of my therapy is to have an eating club and we can cook and together and then so we can share the exhaust you know, reduce that. So I I never know I can continue to have this kind of teaching or lifestyle, but I think 
I think as I say, we are all what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you really pick up the thing and then that will combine. So I also encourage you here, we have students and PhD students, do what interests you and really you care about and that will lead you to something which you enjoy doing and become so successful. I don't know I'm successful, but I'm happy. And, 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 and not many academia are happy mm -hmm. nowadays. <laughs> Thank you, you're happy. Can yeah. you so elaborate a bit on the food sovereignty and land yeah. justice? You mean food, uh, yes, food yeah. sovereignty. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, for in terms of food issues for indigenous right. people, yeah, food sovereignty is their food right. Yeah, and their right to grow the food. Because for now, with globalization, you know, everybody wants a cheaper apple to other countries, you know, yeah. And so, this is it's a little bit complicated about the issue, but if you simp simplify it, it's the people's right about food, yeah, what they can eat. What they can eat, what they can grow. Yes, yeah, on the land, yes. If they lose their land, they don't have the place to grow their food. Yeah. In Taiwan, I don't know how much you know about, you know, the government take away a lot of indigenous people's land. Mm -hmm. So, oh, they don't allow it become a national park. A national park, you can't hunt, mm -hmm. you can't grow anything. But pick up, like, wild vegetable, wild mushroom, or hunt, um, hunt the animals for the festival. It's part of their life, life and you, you, you can't do it. So they don't have their right. Yeah. And full sovereignty is actually to bring that back to them. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do they tax the land? Do they? Taxation for the land. Do they? Tax, tax the tax, land. You know when you've got a piece of land, yes. you pay to own that pack. Yeah, it's not just tax the problem. It's like they, they lose the land. That's the problem. Yeah. So that, that's why you've got to come back to the point mm. where you say, because they're indigenous and it's important to the country, mm -hmm. make sure the politicians do not put a land tax on those land around the area. You know, the problem is they already lost their name. So you can bring it back. But that's the problem, because the government wouldn't allow them to bring that land back. No, because slowly, if you have got enough power or publicity to say, this is our heritage. Yes. Now that's where you go that way and get enough and UNESCO and all that yeah. people to put pressure Okay. Yes, let me tell you the story. We still have indigenous people camping outside the presidential building in order to take their traditional territory back. And it's because government doesn't listen to them. Even our president apologized to indigenous people, but the policy never bring the land back to indigenous people. Believe in it, it will come back. What you do is go on YouTube. They when you make it international, yes. you'd be surprised what happens. If, right. you, if you say yeah. you're frightened, yes. you don't. What you decree is what you get back. Yeah. So be powerful and say it will happen. Yes. Don't know when That's yet. Quite an encouragement. Yeah, we don't, we don't lose the faith, but I have to tell you, it's a long struggle. In it's everything worthwhile is a long struggle. Yes. Just believe that. Yes. I believe that's why yeah. we take the name back. No. Yes, that's hard. No, I, because when you yeah. use the words that is hard, don't use those words. Okay. Right? Thinking positively. So yes. just, just a quick question. So yes. when, when they took the land, because I was yeah. quite ignorant of the history, so when they took away the land, did they relocate the, the, yeah. the tribes? Or yes. Just yeah, we'll to go elsewhere? Or yes, you are right. Usual you kind of land, right, then you cut your cultural roots. You know, that's your ancestor. And this is being, it's a tragedy. It's but then we try to tell, yes, and we hope we have that fetch that you gave us. You yes. see, where people, if you find the same problem yeah. in your part, go to another country and that. And then when you all join together yes. on international web, Facebook or whatever, right? You'll be strong enough where people will, as you say, uh, Samples, 
the two thousand mm -hmm. and one of them. Yeah. And if you don't have uh, Yes, good. Yeah. I think I think you're doing really well. Yeah. Or is it this yes. presentation is part of the struggle? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And as well, yeah. I can yeah. tell you I also do in North American Indian research yeah. and then standing rock, you know, standing yeah. rock. Mm -hmm. And and uh, still drawing force. Yeah, yeah we do, we do we have some one connection. Stick, one yes. stick and you'll be so strong. Yes. It's good. We have a really fast for audience here. <laughs> and then we, we know, you know, we know all this unity together and they are not by themselves, they are not alone. And then if we will work yeah. together, if this wars happen like this, I think. But we start with small stage, yeah? Everything in small stage. Yes. If you think of it, women's right. Can we carry thing. on the talk first, then yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Give us the hope. Yes. So, so yes, it's a part of, like, I believe that you have to do something to make changes that you want to see. And this is what I've been doing. Yes. Yeah. So I don't lose that hope. Yes. And instead, okay. So learn to cook the second part here. And this is my part of my courses, the menu, every semester, like September to December this term, I call four semester. And this is since 2013, actually, and you saw this is, I call the class menu, yeah. <laughs> and this is a different, I invite other people, so uh, very, very uh, interesting. And that's actually, it a lot of my time, because a lot of preparation, a lot of context, a lot of before and after, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and this is all run by FAST, and also Miller's Farm, and also community, yeah. And I also have to find the funding, or sometimes if I don't have the money, I pay my own money because I, oh, I invite a lecture, you know, yeah, and you need, okay. So this is my 2017, the last year, and see, this is Amish, and she knows all the plants, and she teach students, you know, this is all edible plant, yeah, so for this knowledge, and this is the uh, pigeon pea, shu dou, yeah. Yeah, from the, 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 the we brought here. And indigenous people like these beans a lot because that increased men's sexuality. Yeah, okay. And then so the student how to know how to prepare the food. This is kind of bamboo. Only come out in springtime. Yes, sir. Yeah, I miss people. Yeah. So I, I really, and I found this poster all made by students. You know, I think. For me, as a teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm good at finding students' talent, mm. and then I will develop them, and they get the confidence about that, and I, I pay them too. It's not cheap labor, you know, they, <laughs> I, I do pay them yeah, to do that, and they can put that <coughs> with their por 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 portfolio mm. yeah, when they want to find a job in the future. Yeah. So this, and then we build this, that's our kitchen, that's, yeah. I move this to my house now. Well, I'll, I'll show you later. Mm -hmm. And this is the community I work with together. And now they adapt the pattern from the campus. And then also, before, if you go to an indigenous community, nobody will serve you food. So you just come and sit and eat like a guest. And they serve like a servant. But now, you have to do it yourself with them mm -hmm. together. Yeah, so you cook together, you share together. So the position about host and guest, the equality, yeah. So bring that, and so you will know it's not, they are not servant anymore. You, you are work together, yeah. And, and this is the food we grow on campus, yeah. But every season are different. So now, for example, if you go to Miller Farm, you will see it's kind of the dessert then, because it's summer, all the students. And summer is not a good time to grow food in Taiwan. And I also, this is the international student in Taiwan. So I will invite him. To, he, in order to cut this Indian curry, he have to contact with his mom because he never really cook at home. You know, Indian Indian boy. You know, so and this is the way. So in order to prepare this workshop, he have to go and search. He told me he searched from the internet. He called his mom. He called his auntie for all the recipe. Yeah. So this is bring their also the cooking skill, yeah. And I never expect that when I say 
you want to share something with us for, from Indian curry, whatever? He said, sure. But I never know he never cooked at home because mom did everything for yeah. him. Yeah. 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 He's still, he's not post up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, cooking as a way of cross cultural communication. And Indian food in Taiwan uh, is very strong. It's not very popular in Taiwan. A lot of people really don't know. They only know curry, you know. Oh, and, and they only know this curry powder. They didn't know curry has mixed all different spices. Yeah. So it's a good way for them to learn. Yeah. Okay. See, we all cut the traditional way. Yeah. It's not okay. gas. Yeah. You have to find the roots on campus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is the uh, in Adoba, the only lead. A legal place to barbecue and wow. to cook and have drink too. <laughs> because for indigenous people, special festival, we need to drink mina wine. So that's the only place legalized drinking. Yeah. Okay, it's also cooking as a share and cultural knowledge. Yeah. This is actually steam, chinabu. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll show you. And then this is, remember the shelf. Mm -hmm. I bring her to my class, so she introduced all this wild vegetable. This is, as, I think it's much, so all the spring vegetables. And even flowers, wild flowers are edible. And that's knowledge most of students, they don't know. Yeah, and they see. And then they cook all these ingredients. We made that into dishes, and then we share. So I call this and I have another, another one. Yeah, here. This is the one I want him to cook with Jamie Oliver. Oh. Let get shelf. Yeah, together. And he run a very famous restaurant called uh, Tao Wong Bai He Chun Tian. If you come to East Coast, and they have a beautiful presentation, and it's not only food; it's it's an art to me. And this kind of art presentation, yeah. He also have a TV cooking program, yeah. So he's really famous, and I'm really, and he's a good fisherman too, which Amit's man supposed to be a good fisherman, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. And this is in my local. This is actually my home, the local cooking and eating with the local community. See, this is uh, elder, and then that is the thing he produced like tomato and orange and the other things, and a student cook in his place and bring the food to here, and we share. You see the kids? This is com the community kids, yeah? Um, we did that since 2014, and every year we have this. So this farm to table edible heritage activity, including farming, as you see earlier, different festivals, this is shooting ears for a uh, festival for Puno people and ritual, different rituals. We, we also run workshop, cooking, and then you, you pick up doing this knowing and bring the knowledge to become part of you. Yeah. And also, see, and Jim, uh, anthropology, Clifford, say traditional features and how we use past bring to the present and lead them to the features. Okay, so for me, all this farming, this is culture. This is Chinabu, if you look carefully, maybe too small, yeah. And this is also the elder teachers how to make a bamboo plate, yeah. So, um, by hand. And this is to make the wild flowers, make into beautiful crowns, and this kind of singing, heritage, become part of heritage. We also learning the language and culture through thinking. Like I, I don't, I now only speak a little bit Amish, but the other indigenous language I learn through thinking. Yeah. So. Yeah. And now I bring you to the community. You probably recognize her. Yeah. So this is see our indigenous friends. They still put protest in the presidential building outside. Now they push away to the MRT uh, train station. So they want their traditional territory back. Yeah. 
So this fighting is still going on. And this is the chief. He's a cultural leader, also political leader. He's also Li Zhang. Yeah. So like village mayor? Yeah. 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 But he's also a cultural chief. Yeah. If you look, this is this t this is um, tower say nobody is an outsider. Yeah. So we have to fight for the right. Yeah. So um, from university and community, for me, it's this connectedness. We do research, we go and interview people, but most of us, after your research done, you, you're not engaged with your informant. Mm -hmm. But for us, we continue that kind of legacy, and we continue that relationship, become part of our, not, not because of research project I interview you, it's because I care, it's because I want to become part of you and your family and your culture. Yeah. So this connectedness, yeah. And also we respect elder, yeah, different tribes and then different uh, knowledge and even how to deal with millet. When we say the millet is so tiny, the grain, and how, how we eat it, how we take care of them. This is all practical knowledge you can't really learn from book knowledge. And then we bring them back. And even this bamboo, how did you, when you have a pile of bamboo, you don't know how to deal with that. And so it won't become bitter. There's a special way, yeah. And this, all this beautiful elder lady, they're singing because, really, they sing because they can. But they are singing if you don't know the language, they all lose their culture, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and also this from, I have to say I know very little about the plants before I start my project. But because of this, now I can identify it. And then also when I walk in, um, like yesterday I was at Hyde Park. <laughs> that is edible. So I think I've become part of this army. Yeah, yeah. To look at the plants, the first thing I always ask is, can we eat them? Yeah, okay. Yeah, probably before, and then and I have this kind of eye for wild vegetables now, yeah. So it really, it's not only because of my research, it's become that part of you, your cultural sensitivity, yeah. And I, I want to bring that back to my student too, yeah. Mm. And food and farming education as the embodiment of learning, yes. And this is my student who took the course, and then we went to the elementary school, the, um, the, the college kids teach the small kids, yeah, yeah, and yes, the knife, how to hold a knife, yes. And this is, I told you that about Scott bring his students, right? So they also participate in our class, and the students, the local students, to use English to, to introduce the, the food, with, and they do it together. So that's the way they practice English for them to communicate. Yeah. So this is more, and then if they can't say that, they just use their body language. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is the way I think that the learning will become more interesting, and they will know really how to communicate with verbal and nonverbal way. Yeah. Yeah, and elder wisdom is a cultural heritage. And when we do all this, when we went to elementary school, we also invite a local elder come, and they will tell us about the history, the story about this land, about their folklore, about their belief, and this is how we learn, yeah? how we all we learn together. And, and I remember when he said, he said, this is our land, mm -hmm. and now it's become part of elementary school because the government normally will take a lot of indigenous land, make into national park, or make it into school, or make it into so-called uh, fact like sugar, sugar cane. Yeah, plantation. Yeah. yeah, plantation, yes, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, and that is, so we have that, because from the university, right, and our, my students and so also, we brought that, this pattern, or this, this back to this elementary school. 
and, and this elder, I remember, she was so excited because she said for over 60, 50, 60 years, she never seen millers growing on this land. Mm -hmm. So she's really happy this lost culture or cultural heritage come back to the land. Yeah. Yeah. And now they, they use that as part of their tribal education, Minju Jiao Yu, tribal education. Yeah. And see, this is the harvest time, and then that's our student. He's my MS student, he's working on his uh, thesis, and he is from this village. But he used to be, grow up in the city, and because this, now, he wants to come back. And he's now also a part-time teacher, the elementary school, because the project, and they need teachers. And so he now got a job, but it's a part-time job. But for him to return, this is also another way he was writing his thesis about this concept about return. Mm -hmm. For indigenous young people, uh, grew up in a city and now want to return to their so-called their all their parents or grandparents village actually it's never easy so he was writing about that and this is father and son yeah so wow. so that mm -hmm. and it's a very old way to collecting rice yeah to make the rice yeah so this is already lost that because now it's all modernization and we use the machine but this, yeah, so he learned his father's techniques and the knowledge, yeah, where the rice. I actually speak the truth, I grew up not in Taiwan, I grew up in Penghu, the other oh. island of the, so I never really see how rice grow up because it's very dry there. So when I first saw rice, to me, it's, it's, it's really become this reality because I never really see how rice grow. And, and a lot of my students from city, they only see the white rice. They never see this kind of yellow when it's a grain. And when they're back to the farm, they, they plant and they know. So when we work with community, students also work to the rice field. Yeah, so it's not only millet, because now rice is most the, the crops they grow. And that's also the economic resources too. Fishing, yes, uh -huh. yes. So I don't know how many people know how to fix the fishing net. Yeah, right. So all this kind of tech knowledge has fading away. But for fishmen, the first thing you need to learn is how to make to fix the fishing net. Yeah. So we our students learn and how to tidy it up and that is all these things I never knew. I so just go fishing. No, you have to have know a lot of details. And this is when I work with them, I learned. Yeah. And this is also the, the, the elementary kids when we have all series of this course and this is the drawing he draw. Yeah. yeah. So this is for him. And I asked him why he, he painted like this. He said, because I am Amish. Oh. Yeah. So they are really proud of who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think t some people know before indigenous people are not proud of who they are. They try to hide. Yeah, because for indigenous people, they come up with a lot of negative stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that history will try to change that too. Yeah, and this is all, later you will see how all this, because for, for the in-community, they want to see, they all grow rice, and we help them to design some of the, the, the products, so they can, they can become, and this is a local, local, local plant, yeah, and, and they also work with the other people who can help them, because that's, I don't know much about this, yeah, but they can work with other people, and I can, connect them with some of my colleagues who know more about this, yeah, and then they develop more other products so they can use for, and this is kind of me value. I really highly encourage you if you go to Taiwan, if you come to Taiwan, contact with me, and I will tell you 
go somewhere, you know, not go on the uh, on this kind of you know, expensive tour. You can come and spend some money with them because the money go to the local community. Yeah. Okay. And this is the student we join some kind of uh, event. My student, the whole summer, really, they, they learned to be a farmer, really, which when I was traveling, when I was in North America, they spent the whole summer working with them. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is our first team. Yeah. So this is sticky rice. Yeah, you pound that with sticky rice. And, and then with some of this quinoa together, so all healthy things. Yeah. And this is chinabu too. It's kind of steamed rice, yeah? And you, you cover with kind of... Um, it's not banana, it's not banana, yeah, yeah, But you can use banana leaf too. Yeah, so uh, then community, I work with them and give them some kind of, um, like how to make their, their tour much more interesting to attract more tourists, yeah. And now all this kind of share, cooking together, and then food presentation, which, which because I'm doing indigenous restaurant, that's the talk I'm doing tomorrow, yeah. So actually, that talk is kind of my earlier research, yeah. And this is after I work with indigenous restaurant, I know how to make the food more presentable, yeah. So all this, and then, yeah, sense of beauty. So concept about performance also very important, and that's I use that when I in my PhD thesis, and I continue to use that concept. It's the performance is of course from, it's not only performance study, it's also how food can be a good performance to make people, kind of seduce people, I want more. And I hope my talk give you hungry about all this, and yeah. And after all this, this is breathing life. This is my home. And as another my, my education, the thing I can't do on campus, I move to my place. So continue. And I open to my house. Uh, I think people heard about culture survey. Yeah. yeah, you can come and stay with me for free. And I, 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 I change my status, not accept people because I'm here. So I can host them. But I, I also open that, so private property into public space, yeah. And when I have a, a, a house, a guest to come and stay with me, I also let people know, or community people know, or my students, and they can come and like help to know each of them, yeah. So for this... Edible asset. Yes. Sorry? Edible asset. <laughs> yes. And then here. I also, because when I want to raise chicken, we need a chicken from, uh, chicken coops, and I can't do it. Okay, another working hard. Oh, yeah. oh. People pay for me to make the working, to make the, the coops for me. So we, we made two coops, yeah, chicken coops, and that's part of my chickens and geese. And also doing, and the little kids from community will come, and the international, uh, the couch server will come and together. So, so that is, uh, Yo <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's Yo and Yo Yeah, you're right. Yeah. To pray the words. Yeah. So all this working holiday is an environmental education too. Yeah. So is it usually open to public or is it only for students? I open to the public. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So because I when I'm at in Taiwan, I'm not too busy, I will accept the guests. So there's a fan page on Facebook. So. Yes, if you Google that, yes, oh, okay. you Google this, you will find the place. Yes, I do. I think I do have some. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. If you're interested. Yeah. But I, I did. I think I brought some. Oh wow! I'll, I'll find it out later. Because yeah, exactly. I got too many, many things. Yes. And here, I think. I also, also see community project. I have a project. I think when we have a lunch time, you ask me where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And I also apply for Xinyi, the, the private business, like 
and I wrote a project called Be My Family. When I open to my house to the yeah, and what we do, the people come and, and they do. We charge, see, this is two thousand two hundred. Yeah. For people to come and stay with in this village for two nights. They go they don't go anywhere, they just in our village and they have a wonderful time. We do have we do attract fifteen people to come. And there's some people from Taipei Fry. <laughs> so we think our program must be very attractive. And and I have feedback and they are very happy. And this is actually in my house, the lane. So uh, and also promote the slow travel. And I get this pattern to the local community. Uh, so some of the, this kind of tour, and then itinerary, whatever, and, and, and they, can, they can use that, yeah. So, yeah. so I hope this uh, thing, and also I want to produce this hospitality, the concept about hospitality, and I also think for Taiwan, want to big China, is this, is this hospitality. Yeah, it's quite die. So our tourism, it's not that the big mountain, it's not the river, it's people. Because we do we are different. <laughs> yeah. And see, and then also uh, the projects we build is all the students we learn another project to build our own bathroom because we need the outside when we have an event. So we have this mosaic. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Learning by doing, so actually it's conclusion. From literature to tourism, from Western Man Center to this indigenous minority, from literary text to this kind of social and food text, table to farm, edible identity, this is what I've been doing, and this is what I believe. If you want to change, you start doing something positive, and then you can make some really things happen. Yeah. And we do have our T-shirts, yeah. So we also kind of run students also learn to run kind of business model, yeah. And we also have this like postcard. So if you come to Taiwan, welcome to Breathing Life, and I hope you will enjoy what I've been doing. And I hope any questions or comments, and then I can, and then we can share. Okay, thank you. So before we were having lunch, Joyce kind of told told us it was going to be quite a kind of uh, autobiographical uh, talk, and it, and, it, and, it, and it really was that you you have multiple um, uh, journeys there, and it's, it, it really kind of makes us think about teaching and, and how teaching can yeah. Yeah. be different, actually, um, and actually have an have an impact yeah. this, this, um, uh, as well. There's so many things there that I really. Um, uh, enjoy because uh, when students are talking to us about what, what are their potential uh, research topics, yes. one of the things that we always try and kind of drill in them is do something that you actually that really you feel passionate about that yes. you really um, uh, interests you. And, uh, you made an interesting point about the fact that um, not many academics are happy, <laughs> um, um, and probably from uh, from the student angle, you probably a lot of you probably think that. Uh, we have a we have a kind of dream job, um, but from the in and I didn't realise this until I kind of became an academic. But um, I would say a large proportion of my colleagues uh, are pretty uh, heavily very stressed um, um, and not particularly cheerful. Yes. Um, 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 although um, um, uh, so there's a lot of lessons there from um, uh, from your case. I mean. Um, I just had a couple of kind of practical questions. I'm sure you yes, all have a lot of um, issues. Um, I'm, I'm quite curious about the. Um, this, it looks like you're trying to bridge generations. Yes. I thought that was really interesting yes. the way you kind of. Um, um, do you ever actually have any kind of generational clashes? Yeah. Because um, uh, you've got students um, and their parents or their grandparents' generation. Yes. And, Probably in the past, there was a lot of tension between those mm. two groups. Yes. Uh, did you, was that ever a problem? And if so, how do you overcome that? Yeah, well, I think you, you, you really asked a good question. Because there's a different values mm. and then a different lifestyles. And, and when I want to put them together, 
you always have to um, to like to to satisfy both mm -hmm. sides. What I've been doing is I always made them both sides feel valuable. Mm -hmm. So I, when when you make the elder feel valuable, and they they have their pride, and and they become the so-called teachers. And the students, I also met a student. For example, the elder don't never know how to use computer. Mm -hmm. And then for something which students, they can learn from each other. So from that part, I will also make the elder to see the value of the young generation. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, when they're working together, they actually can create more harmonious relationship rather than conflict. Mm -hmm. But we still will fast. Sometimes the elder generation, they have their certain belief. They say, oh, we, do, we don't do this way. Mm -hmm. And so I have to become, to, to tell them, yes, we will do this way because we don't have that mountain. Now we are on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so once you try to um, make them understanding, they actually, they're probably not happy, but they can, at least they can accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think the main issue is you need to make both generations or different generation their value can be recognized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then once they, they have that kind of like each you, it's not who's right or wrong, but mm -hmm. it's like okay, you, we, we want this, but we also need a student their modern version being creative. So all this kind of tradition and so-called creativity or modernity, how they can come back together, become something we are proud of it. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. I wonder how do you build trust? Uh, how I build what? How do you build trust? Like how do you let the local indigenous community? Oh, trust. Yes. Get your relationship with yes. you because you're. I noticed that you're not coming from indigenous yes. background. Yes. Yeah, but it seems that you have a very Cooperative and yes. harmonious relationship with yeah. local communities. Thank you. I think first I, I, I go to community and I let them know I want to learn from them. And once they know, oh, you're a professor from university and you want to come and also invite me to come to university to share my knowledge, I think that attitude already changed. The, and first you have to be accepted. And by for me to be accepted, I not only know them right away. I've actually been working with them since 2004 when I back to Taiwan. Yeah, I, I go and visit with students. You know, my student actually is my treasures, I have to say. I go, I went back with them and spent some time with their generation, their elder generations. To build that trust, it takes time. But you have to be sincere too. And you. To, to let them understand what is your value, you know. So I want more, like, you, I explained to them what I want to do, and, and they recognize that. And then once they, they are happy to come, and also I, I have to say, you have, I pay them when they come, and they are happy. Oh, just tell my story, and I got some money. <laughs> you know, so you, you have a lot of different ways. You can't just take for granted, say, oh, I invite you, you know, yeah. I, they, they are here. And I made them feel they are really a teachers, you know. So they know most of the time they wouldn't come to university. They even not study in the university, and now they come to university as a lecturer, you know. So it takes time, and you need to be as a as a university teachers. You also as a role, you need to be really humble. For me, humble and humble, yeah, because I really know nothing compared with them. You know, yeah. Yes, so, yes. Yes. yes, I have a question for everyone, to be honest. It's about edible plants. Because I know British, British people they love their garden yes. a lot. Mm -hmm. Because I watch BBC program about how to garden, you know. <laughs> but I realized maybe in your garden there's no edible plants probably. But I mean in Taiwan, every, fa every family or household, they will have, and they, they want everything will be edible. Mm. Basically, even just a small balcony, but I'm not sure about this kind of small farm in every household and this garden in family, British family. It's a concept or the value of how to you 
see your uh, my two friends yeah. they are good governors yeah. so Did you want to and, to that? and add yeah. less we must say something well i think we have a move towards um, using plants don't we nasturtiums geraniums that's right it's featured on various programs yeah and i think a move back to foraging as well yes. which you yes. mentioned mm -hmm. yes i think uh, when we were young yeah um, we went and picked wild mushrooms, yes. all the berries, the edible berries in the autumn. And I think there is a move coming back to foraging for roots as well. There's all right. the dandelions, right. I, I believe, were edible. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think we're, we're getting back to it. Mm. Yes. I think it's also uh, within in British culture, is that it's something that was very central to family life. Mm. Um, or households, yes. up until probably about the 1950s, and then probably, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but the sort of industrialisation of food and yes. changing of move to supermarkets and things like that has probably changed that over time, but very much it was the front garden uh, or back garden, one of the others, would be the vegetable garden, yes. usually <laughs> the male preserve, yes. And then the flowers would have been grown by the woman of the household. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there's so, so really interesting things about that. Um, but I think, you know, again, because of the media and, and a lot of these other programmes, that some of these things about growing in small pots on balconies and things like that, I think are sort of re emerging. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I mean, Joyce is sort of pointing to me, but I have two allotments and I don't know if yes. everybody knows what an allotment yeah, is yeah. or has ever been to one in Britain yeah. but this is sort of areas of land where you can uh, rent a piece of land and grow your own vegetables yes. it seems to have become much more popular yeah, the last few decades with, yes yeah. and, and certainly where I live in, in the suburbs of Bristol it is predominantly older retired men, men. from the area <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's interesting to see i mean i've only been, had an allotment for five years um how that is really shifting even in our area which is quite a traditional area whereas mm -hmm. i know that in the city bristol there's a lot more younger people mm -hmm. can be, uh, competing for uh, growing spaces mm -hmm. anyway yes I think, sorry yeah. i think it depends on who you mix with yeah. there's a lot of youtube program yeah. on raw food yeah. mm -hmm. and I've got dandelion. You can eat from flower to leaves and mm -hmm. the medicinal. There are a lot of people coming back mm -hmm. in fact yeah. in eating raw fruits and herbs and everything they're growing. It's just that mm -hmm. the main topic doesn't know is because it's not being written or on television. But if you go into go to the forest, if yeah. people say open day, you go, you'll be surprised how many people you meet mm -hmm. that actually goes back mm -hmm. to traditional food. Mm -hmm. And they'll teach you how to grow and how to look for it. And if you actually go on YouTube, wild fruits or mm -hmm. vegetables or flowers, you have plenty. Mm -hmm. We have some of the survival programs as well, don't yeah, we? Yeah. 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 We have survival yeah. programs. Yeah. 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 A lot of them are American. The British hasn't got a lot of their program. If you want they turn up, got plenty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's how you actually learn. You learn through meeting people. Go on open days where the forests mm. are open and where there are walks. And especially, you know, just go in what is going on, or go to the farm, and you'll be surprised how many people are doing that. Right, right. So could you comment a little bit about your students and what they do afterwards? I know that parents yes. these days tend to be very concerned about right. um, uh, careers. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. um, what kind of careers have your uh, alumni got yeah. into? Uh, yeah, okay. I, I already told you one of the students now back to the village is a teacher mm. and I also have students who back to their own village and the community and become a kind of cultural, you know, the organizer for mm. the events and for to bring the culture back. And one of my students now is going <coughs> to do a PhD. So uh, in the future he will be he will tap like indigenous college, that will mm. be their position. And then I think to to students also engage with this kind of researcher system 
actually about the wild, the, the wild vegetables, edible mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they actually doing very well is because they have extra. This is extra activity like working with communities and also this community service. I think now UK or states are very very popular for university students have to add this kind of community service. Yeah. And because they put that and they help, they be, we've been doing a lot, a lot of events, and that made their CV very, very, I mean, impressive. Mm -hmm. So they actually got a really good job, and then that's all related to what we try to promote, and they continue doing that. So our knowledge, or I call this cultural seeds, now it's kind of spreading up here and there, and go to different parts of Taiwan. Yeah. So it's my revolution. Um, and Bjork, I wonder whether you could comment on, on um, uh, because you have, there's a little bit of overlap between uh, your kind of uh, project and, 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 and um, this focus on uh, cooking and farming. Do you have any kind of uh, um, um, comments on this? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I, I run the guest house in my own community in the yeah. southern part of Taiwan, in, uh, in the Namasha community. And uh, I spend a lot of time to, to use my guest house space uh, to be an artistic space, mm -hmm. to invite artists to make artwork. For example, I made an off-site curatorial practice in the, in the cemetery in my own body tomb has mm -hmm. raised uh, awareness as a black hole mm -hmm. in Taiwan. And uh, uh, Joyce is my, uh, is my teacher in, yeah, in Doha, and she's my friend. And mm -hmm. uh, we were we just thinking about how to, how to collaborate to using the curatorial perspective and uh, food and the FED mm -hmm. ATS uh, program together in the future. I think, uh, yeah, actually, I would also say that in terms of indigenous social movement in Taiwan, for me, now, food and art, this is what I call soft power. Mm -hmm. And this soft power is going to be make a huge impact on people because that's more acceptable. For mm -hmm. example, like even singing, you know, and they sing like there's a army singer. Sumin, I think Sumin gave a talk here, right? Mm -hmm. And no, anyway, Sumin, he, because we were in Bhutan together, and he was singing. He was use his singing for people to see, to know, to understand the Taiwanese indigenous issues and, and culture. So, for me, and I also this belief I share with my students, you can do social, uh, you can be in activism without throwing stones in the street, and it, you can grow food, you can write a songs, you can write a poem, and this kind of soft way to make people understanding and become part of you, or for them, with you, not against you. And then what you could do is have a program, mm -hmm. let's say it's from us, for example the singing, you, if you actually have the people who sing, and then you are educating the people in your country and anyone who is interested will say, oh, I like that, I like that. And they're being aware. And then you'll be able to worldwide find similarity. Mm -hmm. The way to go forward is similarities. Yeah. And then you become stronger. You've got your, your connection. Yes. You see, yeah. that way, when it's the right time, people will connect with you. And that's where your strength is, not whatever. It's having the modern and the and the ancient being put there in media where anyone can go in mm -hmm. and learn, including your own citizens. That way, they oh, mom, I want to do that. They come to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so very, very interested in how you might position yourself in terms of research methods and I expect everybody around this table is struggling with or has issues of thinking about how to do their research. What I was really interested in is often we are told not to go native and um, to uh, distance ourselves from our research participants yeah. to a certain extent and have some sort of objectivity yeah. and I'd be really interested if you could just reflect on how 
you deal with that sort of being in there and part of it and very passionate about that but in terms of writing about your research how then do you move forward and take that yeah thank you julia i have a problem with that you know? ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why i've still not become a full professor yet. Ah. Okay. well, well it's, a, it's it's a joke but it's also true mm. you know because uh, i think I, I spent since 2009 i become an associate professor and and since then i at the beginning, I, I don't care about the academic circles. I want to go on my way. Mm -hmm. So I was doing all this, but uh, because I engage so much, you know, mm -hmm. and it's I need certain distance, and then I also need when I say I need to theorizing about mm -hmm. okay what I've been doing, you know, that kind of distance mm -hmm. for me, I, I now try to distance myself, mm -hmm. and it, it it takes some time, mm -hmm. and that's why. I kind of writing up now, <laughs> and, and and actually this is kind of bringing like um, like engage yourself too much. Okay, also this kind of going native or being native, whatever in, in, in anthropologies trying or not to put yourself me too much in your writing. And how did you write write up all this ethnographic mm -hmm. self? You know, and and actually. I'm, I'm still finding the way, and I'm struggling actually, because then it's become so descriptive, it's all stories, but, mm -hmm. but what's, what is the argument? Mm -hmm. And then you already see the problem is because once I lose that kind of um, objective or you know, the different perspective, mm -hmm. I need kind of different perspective. And that's why I think so far for me, standing point from feminism perspective is, is helpful for me because I want you to know where I stand and mm -hmm. where I start and I think this kind of start with journey and then how I become who I am today and with my research is important yeah mm -hmm. but I'm still searching mm -hmm. that you know yeah and, and how do you cope with because um, I was a bit breathless because you see how so many different projects yes um, uh, is that a problem for um, focusing Yes. Because I mean, I, um, uh, again, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, I guess we're both kind of mid uh, career, mid career stage, yes. and we seem to kind of build up more and more um, uh, projects. Yeah. And it becomes. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? Because uh, you know, I thought I was multitasking, but yeah, you know that's why yeah, when I need, when yeah. I mention single is important. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's true. It's true. I don't have kids to take care of, and I can devote it myself. And I have a three loving sisters, who elder sister who can take care of my mom. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. While well, she suffers from dementia, mm -hmm. you know, and my sister that truly support me. I have a loving family, you know. Mm -hmm. So they say, go and do what you believe, because that's what we can't do, mm -hmm. and you can do that for us. Mm -hmm. So I do have a loving family to support me, okay. and then also, Julia has a twin. You know, she and there's three boys and William too. Yeah, so three boys, and that actually the family. You know, it's I think very few people talking about this being an academic, and yeah. then and then also female. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then also you're not only somebody's wife. You might somebody's daughter. Mm -hmm. You yes. have elder parents to take care of too, especially in Taiwanese society. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to go and visit. That is you a lot of time. And I, I've been really lucky because of my understanding family, mm -hmm. you know. And I also really totally devoted myself with all this project. Mm -hmm. So I don't, sorry, I don't, but that's something I do, I enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's all the preparation, all the contacts, all the after works. Yeah. That's all, it's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then I'm tired. Mm -hmm. So I won't sit there in front of my computer, <laughs> no. So it's all a priority, what you want. You can focus on writing up, just write without doing all this. Yeah. But if you want to do all these events, that's me. And, and then I also, I didn't send an email that I did before because I don't have time. Mm -hmm. I was really busy, yeah, even, yeah. So it's so busy with all this and every time I have to do, and you can notice that I also, I insist for students also engage with all this kind of training because it's part of learning too. So we every event we want poster, really nice poster. Mm -hmm. We want its design. We have this. Mm -hmm. This is breathing life. One of the business car 
I like it, and I I thought of because it's it's here like this. Mm -hmm. You can open this like this. Mm. We all create that. There's a QR code and a link to our uh, uh, face, Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So all this and students are proud of that, you know. And if just ordinary courses, they wouldn't learn something like this. Yeah. So here. You should yeah, yeah. take one, yes. And we have English version, I put, and we also have Taiwan Chinese version too. Yeah. So, and then postcard you see here. And that is all the thing at the breathing life. That is the thing we do. Yeah. Yes, okay, go ahead, you can go ahead. Uh, maybe we should bring out the, um, uh, the coffee. Yeah. We have some. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Good. Yes, sure. <laughs> So I suppose, I mean, again, for those of us who are in academic positions, is that we're very bogged down with the everyday life of mm. expectations, um, bringing in certain numbers of students, academic performance and all the rest of it. And you've been quite innovative, Joyce. I think you did the right thing by going home, actually. Is um, <laughs> You sort of created this niche that overlaps your personal life and, yeah. and work. And, and fought for that in the early stages. So I'm just interested in how that has changed the attitude of the university and that sort of more yeah. institutional framing to see what you're doing and appreciating that and recognising yeah. that. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. I think Julia, you make say when she said I make the right choice going home. It's because I got a job offer in UK. I can stay in the UK. But at that time, nobody can tell you whether I made the right choices. Mm. But now all my friends know me, they know, Joyce, you made the right choice to go home. I wouldn't be able to do this when I'm staying in the UK, speak mm. too much. I would never, never even just build a house like that. Was yeah. there a gut feeling? Huh? Back there? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Was yes. there a gut feeling? Yeah, well, I think you have to follow your heart. <laughs> just, you know, it, it's never easy because like she might, Julia has been listening to, uh, what should I do, you know. Yes. You know? <laughs> There's so many layers. Yes. Oh, that's, that's no. the bottom. Yes. Yes. No. Just, but, but sometimes it's circumstance, is it? I mean, you right. know, you've made, yeah. you know, you didn't have that vision when you went home. Right. Uh, yes. You've made it yes. out of the circumstances right. through which you you've done by getting home, but I'm really interested in what does the university think Yeah, the university, now? I have to say, you know, um, when I start doing this, I, I let me put my colleague, one of the senior, senior colleagues said, Joyce, why did you do this? This won't bring you to become a full professor. Now, I want to publish a paper, and I thought, um, yes, <laughs> that can let me become a full professor. But that's to, to say, when at that time, people think, what what you waste your time as an academia? You should focus on your publication. You should write, 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 and publish, publish, publish mm -hmm. or publish, right? Mm -hmm. But um, at that time, I really, I think then I took the guts at that time. Yeah, I do something I want to do. I'm passionate about it. And for university, at the beginning, they, you know, as long as I don't ask for money, they're happy, you know. And then when we do this, and it become a cultural landscape. They will bring the people to say, see, this is what we've been doing. So let's take the credits. So I'm, but they, I never got fully support by the government or even by my college. But when they want something to show off, they are happy to show that. So in some way, they recognize that. And I, I have to say, we have this kind of so-called um, social participant, social Particip participation center mm -hmm. and and I think I talked to the center the director I said if don't want, I want to be a different university mm -hmm. we should allow the teacher for example what I've been doing should be recognized because I also yeah. bought some of the project money mm -hmm. you know and too so I already in initiated some kind of collaboration and they can be recognized become a full professor you should do this because what I've been doing, but they never come become reality. Yeah. So I still have to go back to the research train. I still have to use my publication to persuade people I am enough intellectual academia ability to become a full professor. Mm -hmm. To me, I want to become a full professor because that's the only thing I can have a sabbatical leave. 
That's the only reason people choose. I know my ability. Yeah. yeah. So that's why. Otherwise, I don't care. Spirit choose. No, yeah. you should have to train someone while you're away, or else all your all your work goes down the drain. No, my students will, but they I are know, really good. But yeah. someone in charge has got to be there before you take the sabbatical, or else you regret. Uh, that's why I have my house. Nobody take away. I know. Yeah. But when you go away, <laughs> yeah. that's why that is a wise well, thing. But I have to say, yeah. one of my other colleagues, who is the expert of Ataya, mm -hmm. we go. They're going to build a traditional Ataya house. Mm -hmm. They are doing now. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of. So I have to say, I inspire some of the other mm -hmm. colleagues who was get more involved with that, and they also believe indigenous education can do something different, you know. So they're going to build uh, a kind of wooden Ataya traditional house um, just next to the Miller house. So gradually, this has become another cultural landscape of Donghua University. Okay, on, on that note, maybe we could just continue our discussion over some, uh, some, some, uh, some coffee and cake.